This episode contains discussion of biological themes, including mating behaviors and sexual selection. These traits are discussed clinically and are not reflective of the spectrum of human experiences. Hello, friends and fiends. Welcome to Bugs Need Heroes, a podcast where an artist and an entomologist team up to illustrate the inspiring ability of insects by creating a Bugs Need superhero. I'm Amanda. And I'm Kelly. Producer Derek and Desi are also here. And before we get started creating this bug-inspired hero, what's what's bugging you, Kelly? Bugging me? No, I mean, I know you hate when I say nothing. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me like you're not paying attention to your own life if you can't well, complain yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I can always find something to complain about. Uh, I had a very nice Thanksgiving with my in-laws. Um, although we we had to sleep on a, I know this episode's coming out in January in the future, but we just had Thanksgiving in this timeline, and uh, my <laughs> husband and I had to uh-huh. <laughs> we had to sleep on a a blow up mattress. Which hate that hate two, that for you. Two adults <laughs> on a blow up mattress. I think by what the, you really need to sleep both... on the floor, but later. Yeah, well, by the morning, we're both, like, trapped in the center of the mattress with two cats, and it was, like, a week-long stay. So my in-laws are wonderful. We stay with my brother-in-law, but it was, I'm glad, my back is glad that I'm home, because I'm too old for that now. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear that. That's the, it's, we've reached the, you slept wrong, now you're broken for four days age. Yes, yes. How how about you, Amanda? What's bugging you? Um, uh, uh. As I said before the recording, um, the rain has arrived in Oregon, and it's what do they they call it, an atmospheric river, which I think is just code for so much rain. So much rain has come. <laughs> so that's oh, I guess what's bugging me is the transmission might be out in my car, but that's a boring topic to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. But at least we we have a very interesting topic today that's not car related. Yes. And it has been teased since the very beginning. I believe this is one of the subjects we teased in like episode one. Oh, yeah. Uh, you wanted to, I think Derek and you really wanted to cover terrestrial isopods, which I think. Terrestrial right? isopods. What? And we have a, an awesome guest. We have my former um, MS advisor and my one of my current doctoral committee members, Dr. Scott Kite from Montclair State University. Dr. Kite, thank you so much for being here. It is more than my pleasure. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> well, we will ask you the customary, um, what's bugging you? What's Anything? bugging me? Well, it's a lengthy list, I'm sure, but um, but let's say uh, at the moment it's it, that it's not quite yet the winter break at Montclair State University. That's bugging me because it really should already be here. <laughs> oh, I Is your brain right. already gone? Your brain's oh, already month. on vacation? Yeah, like, like a month ago. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of like on autopilot sliding down a hill with a scree of rocks all around me as I approach the winter break. <laughs> yeah, what's, the, what's the word? Lot. You're ready to enter diapause? Is that yes, a bug word for? diapause. Yes! That's a good bug word. <laughs> good job, Amanda. <laughs> Yay. I learned about that all last right. week or maybe it was a week before. <laughs> Amanda gets a gold star when she remembers entomology terms. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so we're excited to talk about Terrestrial isopods is the the science word for them, but when I was a kid, we called them potato bugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amanda, what did you guys call them? Roly polies. Mm-hmm. Roly polies. Scott, did you have a different yeah. term for them as a child? Um, we called them pill bugs, actually, but um, but yeah, there's all sorts of other names, right? Wood lice. They, they have a bunch of fun names. <laughs> We're the wood lice. Wood lice? <laughs> I think the Aussies name. the Aussies call them slaters, which is ah, very cute. Very nice. Slater sounds like a type of sandwich. <laughs> Like I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna eat this later. Um. It does sound like a sandwich. <laughs> but we we have some in the lab right now, and um, I have about five undergraduates working on a project with them, and they all call them roly polies, and and uh, I have to sort of tell them it's like that's great, like in house, but you know, like when you're talking to <laughs> other professors, can we call them something a little more uh, technical <laughs> than that? So, you know, please call them isopods or onisids or something like that, or the boys. Yeah. <laughs> they're mostly girls actually and there's the whole story we talk about that today about yeah that seems to be the story with bugs is that it's yeah. mostly ladies yeah it the is roller definitely. girls the ro- oh the roller my gosh girls that's great it's, they're like a, yeah they're like a team why is it they're like a famous roller derby team that's just like the isopods rolling holies <laughs> dang right 
Well, Amanda, it's not too late to start one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would be bad on a roller derby, derby team because I have weak ankles. Mm. Um, mm. And also, I feel like if I opened an avenue for my aggression, there'd be no coming back. <laughs> you got to keep it bottled up. I've been to one ro roller derby uh, match in my whole life. One night, my uh, she was my girlfriend then, but my wife now. She's like, "Oh, we should go see a roller derby match. Wouldn't that be, you know, like different?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." So we went to this to this roller derby match, and it's like again the one time in my whole life that I ever did a thing like this. And we get there, and I like look across the ring, and there's another professor from my department on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, funny. This, yeah, exactly. So That's more faces out there yeah. than you might think. You have to tell me uh, who off camera. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It's uh, somebody you know, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking speaking of our uh, our our roly pullies, why, why is it so? Where should we Where should we start, Scott? What is the beginning of the story of the terrestrial isopod? Um, let's see. Well, well, I can tell you where where the story of them in my life begins, and maybe we could sort of like yeah. go from there. So, um, so. In case you or your audience want to know anything about me, um, my uh, my my interests in, in living things is, is not really isopods per se, or even even arthropods or insects, but uh, but really the way animals decide to do things. You know, how do they make decisions about you know, whatever? Who do I mate with? You know, do I take care of my kids or not? You know, uh, you know, what do I do if there's a predator? Those kinds of things. And, uh, and arthropods offer a very uh, expedient group of organisms to study because you can get lots of them in a laboratory and, and, and do really cool stuff with large sample sizes. And you don't have to deal with the, uh, not that it's a bad thing to deal with the Animal Welfare Act, but, uh, but the Animal Welfare Act, which governs research of vertebrate animals, uh, requires a lot more money and time and, and approval to do things uh, when you're studying things with backbones. So things that without backbones are, are much, you know, you could design an experiment and then study them tomorrow. You don't need six months of proposals and, and approvals right. to, to do that. So, so that's kind of, I've mostly studied uh, invertebrates uh, over my career. And anyway, so, so I had studied other kinds of things and I had, uh, during my graduate work, been, been very interested in uh, insects that take care of their young. And, uh, and did a lot of stuff with that, and which is pretty neat. You know, it's, that's a neat thing anyway, because not very many insects do take care of their young. They mostly just lay eggs and, and leave them. Right. And, um, and so I had I'd done a lot of that work. And then I came to Montclair State as a, as a young faculty member back in the 90s and needed to set up a system. And, and the systems I had been studying before uh, were not as readily available and collectible here in urban New Jersey as, uh, as they were in Indiana, where I come from. And so I had to find something new. And, and so um, one thing I could get in abundance at, uh, at northern New Jersey were terrestrial isopods. And as it turns out, there's a, there's a connection there because they do take care of their young. Uh, the uh, females have a, a brood pouch in which they you know, keep their eggs and they carry them around and, and the eggs stay in there until they hatch. Uh, they produce a... Uh, some kind of, some kind it's like of like a nutrient mix. Nutrient, yeah, yeah fluidy, proteiny, sugary things. Not milk, but it's like milk. Uh, the young can actually feed on that. The young actually can come out of the brood pouch and then go back in for a while. And and so you know, it's it's very, it's like a kangaroo with a hundred. Yeah, they're like little kangaroos. Little joeys, so you know, cute. Yeah. So Amanda, you know, Amanda's oh, head's exploding right now. Amanda's sitting there. Oh, yeah. these are marsupials. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally called a marsupium, the little, the little, uh, the little pouch there. Yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, they're just really cool. And I was like, well, I, I can get lots of these and they take care of their young. So it seemed like a natural extension of what I was doing. And uh, even though I don't really study parental behavior anymore these days, um, the isopods have kind of stayed in my life, kind of like a greatest hits where I'll study them. And then, then we'll, we'll do something else for a while. And then, and then my students and I will be sitting around and be going, Oh, what should we do next? And I'll be like, well, you know, these old, uh, roly polies I used to study. And so we'll go get some more. And, and so we've recently done that actually in my lab, um, just within a few weeks ago, uh, my students and I started a new thing with some terrestrial isopods. So uh, <laughs> Kelly, you? when she was my student was one of the things you had were the terrestrial isopods. And so pretty neat stuff we we bought ours um did your students find them or buy them so we found them um but as it turns out not in sufficient numbers that i would like so yes we are we also bought them. Buy them yeah and, uh, and and that's another reason why i like them because 
um, in the middle of winter, if you decide you want to do some experiments, you just, you know, call up Carolina Biological Supply and they have hundreds of them. So, uh, so they're easy <laughs> to get quick. And, uh, and you can like, like I said before, in my life, what I like to do is to, you know, dream up some experimental question. And then I want to be doing it tomorrow. I, I don't want to be, wait, I don't want to be waiting yeah. for a grant to be funded or uh, institutional care and use committee thing to be approved or what. I just want to go. So you literally go, okay. And then you order the bugs. They come in in a couple of days and then, and then you're collecting data. So it's pretty cool. And they're very low maintenance. They're easy to keep. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, when, um, when, when the babies are in the marsupium, if you were to pick a terrestrial isopod up that was, was carrying them, could you see the young? That's a good question. Or are they really tucked mm -hmm. in there? Well, the the pouch is like, it's like, it's not that it's transparent, but it is a little translucent when 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 they're packed to the gills with eggs and, and gook. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell, like the female's swollen and you can see the yellow fluids and things. I don't know if you can see the young through the, you know, it's, it's like um, the marsupium is like part of the exoskeleton that was retained from the previous molt. Oh, uh, so okay. sort of like the new mars, the, the new molt. If you, I'm sorry, the new molt and then uh, the, the old molt, and so there's just space between the two. Um, so I don't know, but I definitely see the little young when they when they're sort of out on her body a little bit and, and spread around. So, why do they need to be in the marsupium? That's that's a really big question, and uh, <laughs> and so part of my interest in in uh, parental care in general. Uh, not even in the arthropods, but just in general, is, you know, why does any animal provide what's called, you know, postpartum or post, uh, post-embryonic care of their young? Um, so the, the, the default model for animals is, is the egg, right? You know, so you, the egg itself is, uh, is a little incubation chamber in which an embryo can cook and develop, and then it hatches out. And, and then, you know, I would say 99 plus percent of all animals that ever were, um, it, that's it. That's the story. You know, the, the female makes an egg and the egg has all the stuff that's needed to make a new, you know, organism and then you're done. And so the parents go off and make more eggs uh, and make more sperm if they're males. And, uh, and so when any animal takes care of its young, it's already um, an unusual thing for the animalia. And, and when I talk to people about that, they're sort of like, no, it's not. Lots of animals do that. Humans do. Chickens do. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, vertebrates do. Vertebrates do. But vertebrates are unusual. We're, we're rare among the animals. We're, we're relatively recent uh, on the scene. And, um, and most animals are nematodes. So, so you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to talk about the a numbers game between the nematodes and the insects, uh, vertebrates are pretty rare. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so, so fair of you and I'll do it. So, so I've got this sort of like evolutionary question to answer your question, Kelly, <laughs> this evolutionary question about why do any animals do that? Because for most animals, that's apparently not something favored by natural selection. And so when it is, it's, it's kind of a one-off, right? It's like, what, what's going on there? Right. And, and when it happens, it typically evolves independently. So, you know, the terrestrial isopods do this thing. Um, but most crustaceans don't. Um, and, you know, some of the other insects that I've studied that take care of their young, they do. But, you know, you look at an evolutionary tree and the next branch over and all the other branches in that whole family, no one else is doing it. So there must be something that, that independently in different organisms over different parts of evolutionary history favor this kind of behavior. And so in isopods, if I, I'm going to just take some guesses at it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, it's it's probably I would guess in part due to uh, you know, the 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 challenge of living on land when you're you know breathing with gills still when you're a crustacean and you come out of the you know your ancestors came out of the ocean um, but now you're walking around on land but you've still got kind of your ancestral breathing apparatus and all this other stuff so desiccation is a big challenge for these animals um, they they you know, usually stay in places where it's really moist and damp and dark and in the soil, let's say, and whatnot. So, so they stay about as humid as they can, but you know, you got to come out sometimes you got to deal with dry air sometimes. And so part of me wonders if, if it's to do with that, it's protecting young uh, from desiccation. And certainly, you know, Kelly and I have worked with these things together before, like, yeah. like, man, if, if, if you don't keep an eye on that in the lab, you come in in the morning and they're all dead. They, you know, like a cockroach might survive for weeks uh, in a shoebox, 
but a terrestrial isopod will be dead the next day in a shoebox unless you've got sponges and you know various kinds of things they can they can sort of get a moisture source from. We we experienced this recently actually in my own lab. So, you know, my current group of students wanted to study these things. And so we ordered some up and I was like, all right, guys, set them up, make sure they've got, you know, I sort of listed off all the things. And, you know, I don't think they quite understood how important that was. And so, you know, like, like literally two days later, they're texting me, they're like, Dr. Kai, the bugs are all dead. What do we do? And so I came and looked and sure enough, all that they had done wrong was they hadn't, they had, they just kept them in an open container without a cover over the top. Oh yeah. 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 So it wasn't humid enough in there. Yep. Everything dried out and then everybody died overnight. And so, uh, so it's just little things like that. But, uh, but anyway, back to the story. Um, yeah, I wonder if desiccation is one of the big drivers of that, but, it, but there, there are probably other factors, but, but it is interesting that um, sort of the two major groups of them, and we may talk about that today while we're together, there's sort of two different families of the terrestrial isopods, the Porcellionidae and the Armadillidiidae, um, and, and in the lab, we just call them rollers and runners. Uh, mm-hmm. Because one of them, evolved, <laughs> one of them evolved a, the uh, the kind of armadillo shaped body. They can roll up into a tight ball, and that's probably about anti desiccation. Like I just I can seal my body into a, a little little sphere. A sphere is about the best you can do with surface area and volume relationships. So uh, keep your volume nice and wet on the inside by minimizing surface area on the outside. So that's that's how the the armadilliidae do things. But the porcellionidae are shaped differently. They're flat. Um, they're wide. They can't roll into a ball. They can, they can roll into a C, which doesn't do a lot. And, uh, but they do run like, like no tomorrow. They can really boogie. So, um, so they, they seem look to, pretty sad when they're rolled into a C too. Yeah. They're kind of like, <laughs> uh, it's like, it's like me trying to do a sit up at my age. I was like, no, I can't do that. Um, and so, yeah, they're not rolling into a sea to protect from desiccation, but I'm guessing they can boogie pretty quick to get to places, you know, where where it's where it's more hospitable. And then Kelly and I, our our history together is we were looking at those two different groups uh, as part of a, a study where we were looking at how uh, sort of body morphology might map onto uh, anti predatory behavior. So. Mm-hmm. It also turns out that rolling up into a tight ball is pretty good for keeping ants from getting at your soft parts. Yeah. Um, and and okay. running is, is, is a good way to get away from ants that might want to maraud you. So, um, so anyway, so that I don't, I think I went probably way far afield on whatever the <laughs> was that I've now forgotten, but, uh, but that's a lot of isopod stuff. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. I, I, that was kind of my, uh, my guess also would have been to keep the babies humid. Because I'm, I'm certain they're pretty sensitive when they hatch and I would they haven't so. quite hardened yet. And... Yeah. When we talked about wolf spiders, that seemed to be the big factor for the wolf spider was teaching them where and how to get water so that they didn't dry up and blow away. That's what as you, you're saying, like if the mom dies for a wolf spider, the babies will die not because they don't eat or anything, but because they fail to drink any water. Yeah, they don't leave her body. They just kind of stay there. <laughs> And then desiccate, which is That's really sad. sad. That's yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah, we just yeah. we just did an episode on wolf spiders. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. That's 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 your uh, forte. My, my favorites. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they were part of our story too, actually. So the work we did together involved um, sort of wolf spider versus several other kinds of critters, including terrestrial isopods. Terrestrial isopods are so cute, though. They, uh, I, I liked working with them. They were yeah. easy. Um, they don't. They don't bite. They don't They're bite. not going to hurt you. They don't transmit disease. No. They're just cool little dudes. Yeah. Um, and they're really, Scott, did you know they're super common in the pet trade? They make all kinds that. of colors. Oh, I think I have heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And ours turn, we, we feed ours carrots, as it turns out, and they, they do turn orange over time. <laughs> After months of eating carrots, they're the little orange guys. Uh, it's not genetic. It's completely uh, diet-based. But uh... That's the new thing on TikTok. Is to eat so many oranges that you don't have to tan. Serious? Yeah. Oh, God. It's Why? like the well, you know, you want that healthy glow, but you don't yeah. want to sit in an oven for three hours a week. <laughs> so they're eating citrus all day. Oh my God! So, they they're, so they're so they're eating three large carrots a day. Is okay. the thing that oh, keeps carrots. Gotcha. Yeah, that, yeah. that keeps coming up on my. Uh, That's funny. 
I don't know that three you. large carrots a day is going to be enough for a human to. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I just much to think about this girl. You know, the thing is, it turns like your hands orange way before mm. the rest of you. So you're just walking around with orange hands. <laughs> <laughs> like you had like a cheeto addiction i don't i don't care for that <laughs> i'm just saying i've seen it multiple times on on my little vertical screens well what uh what do terrestrial isopods eat is it it's probably carrots sometimes they will definitely eat carrots they'll, they'll eat like any kind of vegetation really um i think naturally they're eating like decaying vegetation so uh even decaying wood they'll they'll eat decaying wood um but you tend to find them, you know, like in gardens where there's compost laying around or um, un it, some people have little piles of wood behind their house if they have like a wood burning stove. And so uh, that's actually when I first moved to New Jersey, the house I lived in, we had a, a wood burning stove and I had a big pile of wood outside. And and believe it or not, I would collect most of my research organisms in my backyard, just go <laughs> over and turn over some wood. And they were like, hi, you know, and, and uh, so uh, so I always tell my students, actually, you know, Kelly, it's funny you should you, you asked whether or not we order them or not. And every time we work with these things, even if ultimately I'm planning on ordering them, I always have my students find them first. I'm like, go out on a big hunt, you know, read about their biology, you know, and based on what you know about what they eat and the desiccation thing and all that kind of stuff, like, where do you think they're going to be? And so uh, that often begins with, oh, we went out to the woods because they're wood lice, right? <laughs> we went to the woods and we found three after searching all day, you know, I'm like, hmm, we need like 300 for our study. How are we going to, how are we gonna get those? And so they start thinking about it and they're like, yeah, you know, combing the woods for hours to find one or two is probably not going to work. I'm like, where else might there be con big concentrations of dead, decaying uh, vegetation, you know? And so they start thinking about that. And um, and then they're like, oh, maybe we need to go to a place where there's not a lot of other vegetation around <laughs> and there's a big pile <laughs> of it. I'm like, that is a good place to start. And so we typically collect them in, you know, mulch piles and, you know, wood piles and things like that. Uh, but it's funny the way students think. They're like, I'm going to go out in the woods where I know they're going to be found. Well, yes, they are there. Uh, but it won't be very efficient or effective in, in, in collecting many of them. So, Now, growing up in Oregon, it feels like you couldn't turn over a, a rock or a log without there being 10 yeah. roly polies yeah, there's under, some there. under there. Yeah. Yeah. I used to find them in my backyard as a kid. Um, our, our like back garden was lined with large stones. And anytime I flipped one over, it was just covered in little potato bugs, yeah. or little pill bugs. Uh, I used to put them in a little terrarium in my house. <laughs> I don't I think never, they liked it very much, but I never yeah. terrariumed the roly polies. I was always terrariumed the uh, the woolly bears. That's where my interests lie. Was with the orange <laughs> guys. But it sounds like they make good pets. You could just I I don't know how long how like the eternal question with these bugs. How long do they live? How I, long could I have a bug friend? Yeah, they in in the lab at least. I mean, I've had them live for years. They 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 can live for a while. Yeah, they can live for. I think even in nature, they can live for like two or three years. Um, yeah, and they just keep getting bigger as they as they get older. So, um, so the really big ones probably are are several years old when you find those. Okay. They are kind of they, they are. I mean, you know, not the yes, cats and dogs are so cute and fuzzy. You know, the charismatic, <laughs> warm blooded, fuzzy yes. things. But, but in terms of like little critters that that are easy to take care of, that are kind of cute. Yeah, they are. They're they. I will agree. They're cute. Um, and and you know, any personality you to them? You're like. Oh, to subject A12, I don't know how you, how you label them, Blue 12, he's got a great personality. Like, great do they have personality. Person <laughs> they have person that's a good question. They have personalities. That is a really good question. And uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I suspect they, they probably don't have much of the way in personality. <laughs> but but you know what? You say something like that, and then you start to think about it. And you're like, well, I don't know that they don't, right? And, and, uh, and certainly, you know... Maybe not so much the insects I've worked with or the arthropods I've worked with, but, you know, I've studied fish and some things like that. And and definitely, you know, when you keep fish, you, you notice that some of them have very different behavioral patterns than others in terms of like, you know, afraidedness or boldness or harassingness of other fishes or whatever, you know. And so you start to pick out individuals based on the way they behave. And so if a fish has, you know, personality, why, why not? Well, I think we're starting to learn more and more about uh sort of cognitive things about uh, invertebrates yeah. and insects um, with spiders. There's been lots of studies now with different kinds of 
types of jumping spider and um, how sort of, I don't know, not to me, they seem dog-like almost. Yeah. If you ever see a jumping spider follow your finger or walk towards you, you know, what, what's going on in that tiny little invert brain? I mean, some people c claim to have like deep personal connections with their pet jumping spiders and it like, <laughs> lives on their, you know, their succulent on their desk. <laughs> and it like recognizes them when they come over. Like that's, yeah. I don't know about the truth of that, but I know that people claim that. But but like we've said before, humans will pack bond with anything, anything. Right. <laughs> I think, you know, like, and this is me maybe just stabbing in the dark. I don't know if there's a literature behind this. Maybe Kelly would know this more than I would, but, but it seems to me like mobile predators tend to have, they're just more sharp. There's, there's, you know, mm -hmm. smarter, but you, you mentioned cognition, right? And I'm thinking anything that's got cognition is probably something that has to solve a lot of complex problems and quickly mm -hmm. and uh and and you know mobile predators come to you know like wolf wolves come to mind right and what did we domesticate as our you know the one of our most common domesticated animals and then wolf spiders come to mind you know as these kind of really complex behaving things um you know we come to mind <laughs> <We're> <laughs> pack hunters you know and so forth so yeah if i was going to look for cognition or at least some really interesting complex behavior in in the invertebrata i would I would look for the mobile predators. I would look, or I'd look at squids and octopi, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Things that chase down their food. I would be looking at them. If octopi lived longer, they'd take over the planet. I, I think they would. Be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you guys have talked on your, on your podcast about some of the incredible stuff that, that cephalopods do. And they're, they're, they're known to do just super smart. But like frightening, almost frightening how yeah. intelligent. And if they, yeah, if they live longer than three years and we're colonial, yikes. Yeah. It'd be over for us because like they like open up jars from the inside right? there's one that like infamously like kept leaving its tank at night and they couldn't figure out why all the mollusks like two rooms over were dying yeah and it's because after the lights went out the octopi was leaving its tank to go eat the other ones and then making it back, back to its tank by morning yeah, yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> like come on man yeah yeah, I know humans that aren't that smart. So <laughs> uh, we've we've discussed on this before the the trouble with uh, Yellowstone National Park and their trash cans because they need to make trash cans that are simple enough for the stupidest human to use, <laughs> but complicated enough that the smartest bear yeah. can't get into them. Yeah. And the Venn diagram of dumb human, smart bear. Yep. Yep. Uh, but I guess Probably. our our really pulleys are not not going to be in that in that camp yeah, possibly anytime. not they're probably more like the cows of the <laughs> your grazers <laughs> they come in spotted variety pet versions is the <laughs> come in white with little black spots yeah yeah there's a pet version that looks like a cow imagine if a cow was a marsupial though wild <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it sounds like it's more like a possum so we're looking like mm, there we go as far as like it, like the babies hang out in their little pouch and then they come out sometimes to hang out on mom's back yep. and then they go back in. That's wild to me. And the milk thing. What? I, we got to get back to the milk. It's I'm sorry. It's all, it's all about milk. <laughs> well, like the whatever the the nutritious ooze that yeah, mom is making the for them. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? Is it is it like wa like the wax on the bee where it just oozes out or I assume they're they're not like. I wish I knew the answer to that. I, I'm sure someone, <laughs> people know the answer to this question. I'm, I'm uh -huh. just not one of them. Uh, but, but my guess is that it's probably something that's, you know, there are some uh, cuticular glands of some sort that are producing this stuff. Uh, if I had to guess what the stuff is, is consisting of, it's probably got lipids in it and carbohydrates mm -hmm. and things like that. All the little, you know, the little energy sources and building blocks that, that babies need to grow, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, sort of what's, what's the purpose of that? I would back to our, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick to desiccation today. I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> that again, if I've got these little, and these things are even more challenged with desiccation because they're so small. They're like, they're like all surface area and almost no little wet volume on the inside of their little tiny uh, cuticles. So keeping them inside and then giving them food on the inside so they don't have to go outside and, and scavenge and, and forage or whatever. Uh, seems like a pretty cool adaptation for keeping your mm -hmm. kids uh, uh, you know, growing and 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 not drying out. How how big are baby roly polies? They're tiny. They're like 
they're like less than a millimeter long, I think. And well, at least oh. the, well, the species that we have, I mean, they're little. So small. Do they breed? Have you had them breed in captivity, like in your lab? I have, and uh, or at least I've. How can I put this? I'm not sure that they uh, they did the deed in captivity or not. And, and I'm going to come back to this. Why are they all women again? That I was talking. Yeah, about. yeah. Um, but but when you collect them or when you get them from a population, you know, maybe you bought them. Um, I think they can store sperm. So I think they only got a mate like oh, once, wow. and, uh, and then they're done. And that, that leads me to this, this, this topic of what about the males, right? So, so you can tell them apart, you can, you know, roll them under and, and look under the hood, so to speak. And, and the males have some little modified um, appendages that they use to transfer sperm. Uh, the females, I think have two uh, openings for, for the uterus, not uterus, that's a vertebrate thing but the, but the reproductive openings for their ovaries and uh, and the males have two little things that they can transfer sperm with but to be honest with you i've rarely seen males in in the animals i've had in the lab yeah. so even when we collect these things ourselves we don't get like a 50 50 sex ratio we get like a 99 percent female ratio they're all females and so my students and i have talked about that many times over the years like what's that about and and there are several possible explanations. Um, one explanation might be that because the females of, of, are making eggs and, and they're, you know, making and doing all the things to take care of their young, they, they eat a lot more than males, I'm sure. A lot, lot, lot more than males. Mm -hmm. so when you go collect these things under decaying wood or something, well, you know, the females are kind of where they need to be. They're, they're eating, 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 eating. All the, mm. time. the males may not need to, right? So I don't know where the males are. So that's one possibility that when you collect them, you're just biased because you're just you're going where the females are feeding. So you're collecting mostly fem females. But the other explanation is much more interesting. And the other explanation is that there are populations of terrestrial isopods that have a bacterial endosymbiont that feminizes male embryos. And oh. that's the more interesting story. Yeah. So so a lot of different arthropods have uh, co sort of co-evolved with this kind of bacterium. It's in the genus Wolbachia. Um, mm -hmm. And Wolbachia does interesting things in different kinds of bugs, but in terrestrial isopods, it feminizes male embryos. And it's transmitted vertically, meaning the only way that you get a Wolbachia infection is that it was in the cytoplasm of the egg that you hatched from. So, so mom, if she's got the Wolbachia endosymbiont in her, um, when she makes eggs, the cytoplasm of the eggs also have the bacteria in it. So you, you don't get it from mom, you know, coughing on someone else. There's, there's no, there's no vertical, I'm sorry. There's no um, horizontal lateral transmission among different individuals. It's all mom to, to offspring, mom to offspring. And so if you are a male in an egg, like a genetically male uh, embryo in an egg, and the egg cytoplasm has Wolbachia bacteria in it, they do something to uh, to the DNA that that turns on, either turns on or turns off, uh, turns off male stuff or turns on female stuff. Probably, I'm thinking female is probably the default, and so you just yeah. probably block some early signal that would turn on maleness, so to speak. And uh, anyway, long story short. Um, so you find these populations that have Wolbachia infections and most individuals are female morphologically, even if genetically, the, the population might have a genetic 50, 50 ratio, but, uh, but everybody's wow. female. Yeah. And, and so we talk about this with my students and I talk about this sometimes and we're like, well, what the heck's that about? You know, <laughs> what, what does anybody get out of that? Right. And, yeah. That'd be my question. And so here's the logic. Here's the logic. So I'm this, and, and again, none of these organisms you guys, I'm sure, talk about this on your podcast. None of these organisms need to think about any of these things. Uh, and for a guy who in is interested in decision-making behavior, it's 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 interesting how little decisions actually have to do with anything in the way life works. But um, but but it logically, under the logic of natural selection, suppose you've got two variations of Wolbachia in a in a population, and some of them feminize embryos and some of them don't. If the only way that you can get transmitted to another organism is mm -hmm. through the cytoplasm of an egg, then the logic is make more eggs. And how do you make more eggs? Make more daughters. <laughs> and so, um, 
<laughs> so a little a little thing that that fusses with uh, with the sex of an offspring when the only way you can move through time is by jumping from mom to egg to mom to egg to mom to egg. Uh, natural selection is going to favor anybody who makes more eggs. Oh, yeah. uh, in the Wabakia population. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Uh, and you know, like we often do say on the pod, you only need like one male. <laughs> you don't need a bunch exactly. of males. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's another fun. Uh, conversation to have with with uh, <laughs> students who are like maybe 18 19 20 years old i sound like a creeper when i say it but but it's like you know think of our own species you know um you know one fellow <laughs> makes enough sperm to fertilize all the women in the whole world if there was only enough time um you know and so so the way that genes move around is very different in males and females and the way evolution plays out and, and i like to talk to students about you know everyone knows that, you know, Darwin's claim to fame is that he came up with natural selection and, uh, you know, he wrote the origin of species and all that, you know, everything changed after that in biology. But a lot of students don't realize that one of his follow-up books was on sexual selection. And, and so the same person who thought of natural selection also realized that males and females have different evolutionary environments, so to speak. Um, right. So, so yeah, so you don't need very many males. And so then there's a whole interesting discussion about, well, then why are there so many males? <laughs> and that's a whole other, you know, discussion. Um, and, and it makes sense when you, when you think about it. So Darwin even talked about that stuff, you know, w way back in the day. Um, and, and personally, I find the latter just as interesting, the, the sexual selection stuff, just as interesting as the former, because the former just kind of makes sense. Like, you know, when, when, when natural selection came out, people were like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Duh, you know. <laughs> Uh, but the yeah. sexual section stuff is a, lo is a lot more tricky and fun and, and has all sorts of weird ways it played out in, in different organisms. And I'm, I'm sure like uh, when when this kind of talk was coming out at the, at the time with Darwin and producer Derek is saying we're engaging in Wallace erasure here by not mentioning <laughs> Wallace. But... <laughs> and Wallace. And Wallace. <laughs> and Wallace. <laughs> that it, it may have been difficult for people of that time period, scientists of that time period to accept some of these, uh, sort of these, these views yeah. on animal sexual selection. Yeah. I was just talking yesterday about how the Victorians just messed all sciences up. Yeah. <laughs> it's all they do. It's all they did. Nothing is safe from the Victorians. <laughs> Dar Darwin, actually, interestingly, if, if there, if anybody, if anybody could be considered, I don't know if you would call him a feminist, but certainly, uh, Darwin was relatively rare among his male contemporaries at the time in talking about how the, the intellect uh, of, of, of organisms, but especially humans in this case, you know, that, that in humans, he felt that intellect was uh, the product of environment. So, mm -hmm. so that, you know, there, there was a, a very sexist, um, you know, point of view in, 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 you know, society at the time that men were superior to women and men were smarter than women and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And Darwin took the relatively controversial view that that's only because women aren't afforded the same opportunities in education as, as men are, um, which is pretty cool. I'm actually, I think that's really cool. Good guy, Darwin. You know, yeah. yeah. Right. At the same time, <laughs> you've got like the Genesis, you know, saying whack yeah. a dude about different people. And uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the S word on your show. <laughs> We try not to, but we'll believe yeah. we just... you. Yeah, the editor can take that right now. <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, but anyway, uh, that's pretty cool. And, and so the person who sort of like set the stage, I think, for modern biological understanding of the way mating behavior and, and males and females evolve and, and all this kind of stuff was actually uh, pretty open-minded, uh, uh, you know, about male versus female intelligence at the time, which is which is really great. And, uh, and I would, I would say that the, um, if, if I had to paint with a broad brush across all the animalia, yeah, it's usually females that are under selection to be smarter. Uh, they have to be, they have to be to do better uh, at, at leaving copies of themselves. Males just have to have sex with somebody. I mean, that's really all it comes down. They got to fertilize someone's eggs and that often does not require a lot of sophisticated, uh, 
you know, uh, decision making, so to speak. But females got to make really sophisticated decisions about about all sorts of stuff. So uh, even about male choice, a female deciding which male is the right male to mate with is exactly. a big dance decision. just right. Your dance was the best <laughs> dance I've seen yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So so, you know, if I'm a male, I'm a one trick pony. I've just got to make a pretty dance or I've got to sing the right song or I've got to you know, smell the right way or whatever. Uh, but as a female, I've got to do computation. I might, <laughs> yeah. I might be comparing multi, maybe hundreds of males, right? And and I have to decide a choice or or managing up, so to speak. What if I'm getting harassed by multiple males? You know, it, 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 I'm not talking about humans now. I'm no, not, we're talking about we're talking about ducks. We're talking about, yeah, we're talking about ducks now. We're talking about you know guppies at, at this point or something like that. But but you can always have fun and extend it to humans. But but uh, but just I'm thinking I'm a female guppy. And I spend all day long doing two things, trying to find food so I can make more eggs. And I'm also a live bearer, by the way, like isopods, so I'm not straying too far from our topic today. Um, that's one of the things I do is I try to get enough food to make more kids. The other thing I spend my whole day doing is dealing with males who are harassing me for, uh, for intercourse because the males have inter it's internal fertilization. So the males have a modified anal fin that they use to, so, so. So largely she has to consent to that for that to happen. And, uh, and so she spends a lot of time fending off meals and, um, sounds exhausting. It, it sounds very exhausting to the point where there's some studies I've, I've seen, and maybe you guys have talked about this on your podcast, where when you go to like Trinidad, where guppies are from, um, there are populations in which you'll find like a, a section of the stream and there's a whole bunch of females there and there's no males to be found and you got to go like a hundred feet upstream and then the males are up there. And so naturally, you know, the scientists are like, all right, that doesn't make any sense because male guppies are, are like notorious for being where the females are and harassing the females. And it turns out that the females are hanging out where the predators are. <laughs> so, you know, so to me, that, that just adds this whole level of interesting decision making. It's like, I'm so tired of harassment. Eaten than deal with you for one more second. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. And, 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 and I'm sure you that. guys can relate to that, right? Like sometimes you'd, you'd rather go somewhere dangerous than just put up with males that are hitting on you or harassing you. And, and, um, and wow. So, 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 um, anyway, like if, back if to humans the, go into the, to the, the gay clubs just to avoid getting hit on. Yeah. By yeah. Dudes. I think we talked about that last week, Kelly. I think we talked about that. They're yeah. Like, you you got to find spaces where there's just no dudes. So you can, be a person for 10 <laughs> seconds please well then then you get which we we see in cuttlefish you get crafty males who pretend yes. to be the imposter males yeah. imposters who pretend to, pretend to be ladies yeah or in my case i've been to a gay club and straight men have pretended to be gay so that they could hit on me what ridiculous yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow yeah, there is no so, safety for maybe women. men are so dumb as i said then <laughs> i should have tracked that that anecdote was almost certainly cut from the episode. Oh, so. I'm sure it was. <laughs> After all this, will be cut too. <laughs> do, do we know if there's any correlation between like population of males? You were saying like, why do we need so many boys? So is you, the, this may be something that has been researched. Is there any correlation between male population and involvement of male in parenting? Like, you know, a gorilla, there's usually one dad gorilla. Yeah. And then there's a couple of gorilla wives and then they're, they're kids. And he's, he's not super involved, but he's around, yeah. you know? So that would say, well, that goes against the idea that like one male, because he's involved. Yeah. Whereas if you could just impregnate as many ladies as possible and then bounce the yeah. way like a bug does. I don't know. That's an interesting idea to me. I think that that in general, like when you go looking at uh, populations of, of, of animals um, of different species, like 50-50 is the norm, right? 50-50 mm -hmm. is the rule. It's the rule even when it's not mediated by chromosomes. So uh, so in our species where we, you know, we're, I don't remember what the word is off the top of my head, but but males have two different kinds of sex chromosomes and females have the same kind. And, and so, you know, put them together like you did in genetics class and you get a 50-50 ratio of, of sons and daughters. Um, and, and, but even in, uh, temperature dependent sex ratio species, like, you know, some certain kinds of lizards, for example, they have 50, 50 sex ratios. So, so the females, you know, sort of behaviorally mediate, uh, how many sons and daughters they have. And, and so, and so it's actually relatively rare to find a species where the sex ratio is so biased. Um, and so to answer your question, I think it probably doesn't map onto parental care so much because in gorillas, for example, 
um, they have a 50, 50 sex ratio. Just most of the males don't, don't get to mate. Um, mm -hmm. and so the males, you know, keep away other males from, from the, the access to the females. Um, whereas there are species that are, are we allowed to go off topic? We're not talking about isopods. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, this so happens there, all the time. Yeah. So, so here's a fun one. So, so then, then since we're talking about sex ratio, um, here's a fun one. So, um, Hymenoptera, the, the, the bees and the wasps and the ants, um, they have an interesting, uh, sex determination mechanism called haplodiploidy in which if a female just lays an egg and never mates or, or I should say, doesn't inseminate an egg, it lays an un uninseminated egg, it hatches into a male. If she lays an egg that has been inseminated, it hatches into a daughter. So haploid means you've got one set of chromosomes, one set of genetic material, and diploid means you've got two sets. So if you've got two parents, you're diploid. If you have one set of parents, you're, you're haploid. And so haplodiploidy just means, you know, males are haploid, females are diploid. And, and so females can uh, determine whether or not they have sons and daughters just by determining whether or not to, to let an egg be inseminated. So they, they might mate once and they've got a, an organ called a spermatheca and the spermatheca holds the sperm and she can use that sperm to fertilize eggs or she can not and then have sons. So here's an interesting story. There is a, a kind of a, a wasp. It's a little uh, parasitoid wasp. Um, Nessonia is the genus. And, and I know about this because in grad school, uh, I was thinking about working with a lab that was studying this. It was a lab that was interested in sex determination. And so they found something interesting that if a female is the only female laying eggs in, in the place where they lay their eggs, she tends to make about 50, 50, like, you know, 50% sons, 50% daughters. But if another female comes along and sees a group of eggs have already been laid by that, by a, by a female that was there before, she makes more daughters than sons. And here's what happens when the eggs all hatch, uh, they all mate among themselves first before they all fly away. Right. And so, um, wait, which way did I say she makes more sons? The second female comes more. along, she makes more daughters. That's right. Daughters. She makes more daughters. She makes more daughters. Wait, no, do I have this right? No, no, I don't have this. I'm sorry. I'm telling the story all wrong. He's going to rewind. Rewind, rewind. All right. Rewind. Sorry, rewind Cause I got it. No, I got it wrong from the very beginning. The first female, the first female, makes almost no sons. I'm sorry. She's just like a 90 to one, right? So it's like, it's like all daughters and a handful of sons. And then you might say, well, what's that about? Well, it turns out if no other female comes along, the, the daughters and the brothers and sisters all mate among themselves, um, which is kind of gross, but, but they do. And, um, and so if you think about it now, I'm mom, I'm being clever, right? I've got a hundred eggs. Why do I make 50 sons? If they're just going to mate with my daughters, I'll get a lot more grandkids if I have mm -hmm. daughters. Yeah. And, and a yeah. handful of sons, right? So that makes sense. I'm sorry. So I told the story wrong. So second female comes along. There's a bunch of females going to be born from those first set of eggs. I make more sons to outcompete the original uh, female sons, right? <laughs> and then the third female that comes along and finds a bigger mass of eggs, she makes even more sons, right? And so again, it becomes a male competition game. It becomes a male arms race. Yeah, it's a male. <laughs> exactly. The, the more daughters there are going to be to be to compete over, make more sons, right? It's it's, it's you're up in the odds that that your 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 sons are the ones that are going to be fertilizing all those females. So again, do they think about it? Probably not. They probably don't have cognition, but but it's what they do, and uh, and so. I know we're going far afield from isopods and stuff now, but, but we were talking about, you know, what, what's the importance of how many males there are in the way animals behave and, and the decisions they make. So back to your question, Amanda, I think it would be kind of interesting actually to look at something to do with mate choice, mating behavior uh, in isopods that have Wolbachia infections, right? Because yeah. if most of the animals in the population are females, that changes the reproductive outcome of any uninfected eggs, right? That there's got to be a deeper story there. Maybe that's, maybe this will be my next research project, right? Cause, cause that, and, and I'll credit you guys because <laughs> it really suggests there might be a deeper story if for, you know, so many generations, these two different, this bacterium and the isopod have been co-evolving. It, it, it would not be surprising if there's some deeper sexual selection playing oh, out. Uh, well, yeah. 
is there courtship behavior in isopods? Oh man, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that question. I, I know there's female choice. I've read papers. I don't really study that myself, but I've read papers about it. Uh, and females do uh, exercise choice over certain characteristics of males. And I, I'm, it's probably different to different species, but I'm thinking it's yeah, things but like- But I wonder if the Wolbachia has any effect on courtship and wouldn't that there's be a whole lot to look at. There is, there absolutely is. What's and what, that, what's that, that cat one where like, if you get, I think it's toxoplasmosis. And if you get it, you love cats. <laughs> I think I all know. cat owners have toxoplasmosis. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's what it's about. <laughs> I was yeah, wondering why there were cat people. Because <laughs> you've got, you've got brain amoebas telling you, that love your cat. Interesting. The cat's the best. Those microbes, man, I'm telling you, it, it really, the microbes kind of run everything. They do those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The microbes and the fungi. We, we did a whole episode on The Last of Us. Oh, and, that's um, cor And cordyceps, which was. Yeah. That episode wild. kind of messed me up, if I'm honest. Yeah. <laughs> We're all just cities of fungi. Yeah. We're all just walking around, little micro. Who's driving us? Oh, don't like yeah, that. Like, I, yeah, I think. I mean, I think that like our, you know, our bacterial fauna is like has like evolved to like make chemical signals that make us eat different oh, things. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's just you think my dad's control. going through a whole your gut health is makes all your choices for you thing right now, where he's like. You gotta eat the right food because if you eat the wrong foods, the microbes in your tummy tell you eat more bread, and then you get fat and die. So, <laughs> <that's right. laughs> Some dad logic, right? There. Dad logic. Well, like the idea being that, like, I mean, you are what you eat, quote unquote. The microbes that you feed are the ones that will continue to sell, send out those chemical influences. Yeah. If you only feed the bread microbes, pretty soon you're eating only bread because your tummy tells you you need more bread. <laughs> Here's a little aside that I, I will almost certainly cut. <laughs> they're in Transformers, like they're little, they're cars that turn into robots or whatever. But there's also cities that turn into robots. So they live inside other robots. Ooh. And there's like a Transformers very, lore is crazy. It's really crazy. But like, once you think about it, like, oh, these are superheroes who also one of their superpowers is that they turn into a car or whatever yeah. but there's yeah. a few special transformers where their super ability is that they can talk to the city directly ah. and no one else can do this and like how cool would it be if you could like ping your gut health and it could tell you oh actually we do want more bananas yeah. <laughs> i'm getting low potassium i did read something the other day that like after you if you get like a fecal transplant after having like c mm -hmm. diff or whatever it'll change your like cravings like you will yeah, those bacteria will then say, "Hey, actually, we like more, more sugars than the last guy did." Yeah, which is just weird to think about that. You know, we're not really in control. Yeah. At well, all. having been pregnant, like the cravings you get while pregnant make no sense unless there's someone else sending up information saying, "Hey, man, I need way more peanut butter than you're giving," <laughs> and you're like, "All right, here comes the peanut here butter." Here comes the peanut butter. <laughs> Because like, because pregnant women will get pika, they'll eat chalk, and like, there's no reason for me to eat chalk nutritionally, unless someone else is telling me, "Hey, man, I need that stuff that's in the chalk. Send it down. You need some kind of mineral in the chalk." Yeah, like exactly. It. One of my fitness supplements has a uh, has silicon dioxide in it as an ingredient, <laughs> and I'm like, mm, I don't know about mm. that. Mm. <laughs> Delicious silica. So generally, we make a superhero out of whatever bug we've been discussing okay um so we might ask you some like what are some superhero abilities that a a, a hero based on a terrestrial isopod might have so, so just quickly sorry for me we keep saying terrestrial isopod mm -hmm. which i want to clarify that that means that there's aquatic isopods yes as well. yes this is absolutely true yes yeah, and the, the and the aquatic ones are much bigger. Actually, they they the thing about living in the water is you know you're buoyant and everything, so you can actually get a lot bigger. Um, so yeah, so I think some of the 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 aquatic isopods are kind of big. Can you imagine if you rolled over a log and an isopod the size of like yeah a pup ball was under there? <laughs> That'd be I think terrible. the aquatic ones are like watermelon sized. They yeah. live in the deep deep sea by the thermal vents. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, it turns out lumbering your mass around over land where the atmosphere is like a thousand times less dense than you are, right? So you have no buoyancy on land. So there's all sorts of things that happen 
uh, that, that keep you relatively small. Like we're, you know, we don't think about this because we're like, oh, there's bigger animals than humans, you know, uh, you know, elephants come to mind or whatever, but, but elephants pretty rare. Right. So like, we're pretty big, like we're among the yeah. biggest animals there ever were, um, honestly. And, uh, and, but, but, but bigger than us, you know, when you go in the water, things get bigger quickly, right? So the biggest mammals are in the water, the biggest reptiles were in the water, and, you know, the biggest everything are in the water. So I think the biggest isopods are in the water. Um, oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but, if, but, but if I was to, to think about superhero uh, special powers for, for this kind of animal, then I would go right back to the, where we started today, which is the rollers versus the runners, right? So, mm -hmm. so, you know, you've got kind of like a tank superhero you know who can roll into a ball and they've got you know a thick metallic perhaps in a superhero like a thick metallic armadillo hinged you know uh maybe maybe that's their 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 uh their uh i'm trying to look for the right parlance for what the outfit a superhero wears <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The outfit the, the costume the cape yeah right so so maybe they have a cape that you know, rolls into a, mm. uh, a round ball with, with, you know, tight seals. And, and so you could do anything to them. You could like, you know, throw them in the water. You could throw them in the sun. You could do all sorts of stuff. And all they do is, you know, do that thing. And, and uh, it kind of keeps oh, out right the, uh, the bad stuff from the environment or whatever radiation keeps it out. Um, so, so you can imagine that, that one terrestrial isopod superhero has sort of like a, a, a defensive superpower, right? But the runners, on the other hand, like they are freaking speedy for for the arthropod world, you know, like like clocking them. If you were racing them against other arthropods, they boogie along pretty well. And uh, I mean, they're not they're no cockroaches. And have you, <laughs> really, have you done cockroaches yet? Oh, uh, yeah. We, we just talked about cockroaches with another another podcast we had guests yeah. on. And yeah, so they Ooh. boogie. But uh, but but for for crustaceans, I would say they, they're they're pretty they're pretty swift. So, um, so again, you know, their superhero, uh, uh, morph is going to be a little different. Right. Uh, and, and, and so they're going to be a little more sort of like, um, uh, aerodynamic, you know, like, flat. like the flash. Yeah. Like the flash, <laughs> Pew, they can move really quick. So, so relatively fragile, relatively fragile. So they're not going to be a tank. They're not going to be, you know, fighting one-on-one. -on -one. They're probably more likely to zip around quickly and, and, uh, and, you know, knock, knock the bad the villains off their feet from behind, you know, like that kind of stuff. They're not stealthy, but they're pretty quick. Well, they, they have a built in um, arch arch nemesis, which in the, the bug world would be Desdera crocata, the woodlouse spider. Yes, that's right. With those big boy fangs. Yeah. So, so the, uh, <laughs> so this thing doesn't help you when that super villain is, it? so they must have to like tag team in some kind of way, you know, where like, both of them must be present for the battle with, with that super villain because the tank doesn't have protection anymore. So you've got to have something to, to balance that out. So speed there's, must have to matter in that, in that kind of battle. Oh, I, I wanted to ask, um, where do woodlice come from? Where do they come? Like originally? They're not native yet to North no, America. No, I don't think they're, they're not. They're, they're, they have kind of like a, I think they've got like a global distribution now they're everywhere but uh but and and i'm i'm kind of guessing at this point I've, I've read this somewhere and i'm misremembering it but i think i want to say they come from like um you know like what is today the middle east perhaps mm. or or even maybe like the mediterranean yeah asia maybe even to um yeah i mean they're everywhere now they're they're believe it or not there are desert species of these things um wow. and, and and interestingly enough because you guys were talking about you know why would something take care of its young and you know all that kind of stuff like there are some there are some desert species of these things where they have like really sophisticated social behavior uh where they live in little colonies and they've evolved what appear to be like individual identities uh that so they communicate a lot through um chemical like like pheromones mm -hmm. um and and i believe i've read a paper that said they they have individual level recognition of one another which again is extreme something yeah. one of these extremely rare things you know like most animals don't have an individual identity other individuals you know recognizes them being different from someone else so these things have um um pheromone molecules that have kind of a species component so it's like you know with their little antenna like oh there's somebody from my own species here you know and then there's um maybe a family level 
uh, chemical, um, you know, um, what's what I'm looking for. That's, that's something that's specific to their own family, right? Their own genetic group. Their relatives. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I can mate with you because you're not related to me. You smell different, right? Like that kind of thing. And then, but then within the colony, um, in the, like, you know, then you're Bob and you're Sue, cause you smell a little different, right? They got unique chemical fractions on the pheromone. And that's pretty interesting and pretty, pretty unique. Uh, like, you know, honeybees, <laughs> the I don't question think is why? Right. Yeah, right. So, so, so where I'm going with that is like, so these things are living in perhaps the harshest for them, the harshest environmental conditions they could possibly live in. They live in a desert and they can't dry out. So I wonder if there's some level of, you know, a shared coordinated something going on in maybe the digging of burrows or, uh, you know, or the maintenance of something that keeps the you know, where they're, where they're, you know, where they're staying at the acceptable moisture levels, maybe gathering of certain things and bringing them back. But, uh, but I unfortunately know very little more than just the fact there might be some level of individual identity. But when something has individual identity, it starts to make you think, aha, you know, what's the function? Like, why would natural selection favor right. being recognized as Bob versus Sue? And that usually uh, uh, suggests, you know, long-term relationships among members of the same family and, and perhaps division of labor and, and things like that. Um, you know, like, so the honeybees have caste specific, you know, uh, identifiers, but I don't think they, I'm not aware of any that have individual based, you know, like, you know, like that my name is this and, and I'm different from that one. Yeah. Cause uh, I, I suppose don't have a caste system. So I don't believe so. Yeah. That's interesting to me because I would I would connect that to a, you know my human bias is to connect that to intelligence the idea that you could recognize yeah. a neighbor yeah right so it would be interesting to look at these terrestrial uh, these desert isopods to to kind of like you know Kelly started this whole conversation off by talking about cognition like if I was going to look for cognition I'd look there if yeah. I was going to look for cognition in the isopoda I would look there well here, here's a new study for you Scott and your students too. yeah. <laughs> give us something to do. Yeah, cognition is so, you know, it's 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 tricky to ask animals what they're thinking. Um, you know, especially if the answer is likely to be I'm not. <laughs> I'm just reacting. Yeah. Yeah. But um but but you know, um you know, I know Kelly and I you know, go way back. We're friends from a while back and when we first met actually, we were talking about doing research together and 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 I was like, "Well, what are you interested in? What would you like to do?" And and you went right to crows. You're like, I want oh, to study yeah. crows, you know, and, and, and there is an example of an, of a, of a kind of animal where there's some good evidence that they can turn uh, ideas around inside their head uh, before they make a decision. Right. And, and so there's some ways to tease it out experimentally, you know, problem solving that requires as kind of an abstract, something abstract must happen for them to choose the right answer mm -hmm. basically. Um, but, uh, but I think you can get away with, yeah. So, so. I don't see why the kinds of things they've done with crows they couldn't do with you know other kinds of animals. So you uh, you've done maze work with isopods, right? Yes, that's in fact what we're doing right now in my lab. Um, and by maze work, we're we're not really interested in when people talk about animal mazes. Um, people tend to to think about you know like rats in mazes and learning and you know and that kind of stuff. And we have done a little learning in my lab with with arthropods, but but I'm less interested in learning and I'm more interested in decisions. And so a maze also presents an opportunity to ask an animal, do you want to go left or do you want to go right? <laughs> you know, when, when you're given a choice, what do you decide to do? And so we've constructed some mazes uh, where an animal can move through a, a big maze that has a se sequence of left-right decisions to make. And, um, and what, one of the things, and, and we're hardly the lab that discovered this, uh, but, but one of the things that people studying this kind of behavior have found is that, is that when animals are forced to make consecutive decisions about uh, turning left or right, it, it, their, their behavior kind of maps on to their circumstances. So an animal that's like really happy like, that maybe there's a lot of food here. Um, I kind of like being here. There's mates here. It smells like members of my own species here. They tend to make a lot of turns in the same direction. And so I'm, you know, sort of by human analogy, imagine that you're in a building and you don't really want to go outside. You want to stay in the building in the same part of the building you're in. So you're walking down a hallway, you come to a T junction, you turn right, 
you hit the next T junction and you kind of want to go back to where you were. So you turn right again, right? It brings you back in the direction you were going. But animals that want to get the heck out of Dodge that are maybe running from a predator or they've exhausted the food that's here and they'd like to fly somewhere else where there's maybe food somewhere else. They're very interested in navigating a straight line. They want to keep going in a straight line uh, in some direction. And so back to the human thing in a building, building's on fire. I really want to get out of here. Run down the hall. I hit a T junction. I turn to the right. The next one, I'm not going to turn right again. That takes me back to the fire. I'm going to turn left. So every time I want to correct for a straight line that I have to turn one direction, I'll turn the opposite direction the next time I'm given a choice. Right. So that's, that is what we've been finding with these isopods is that, for example, when you, uh, when you put a bunch of like ant pheromones in the maze, they're like left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Let, let me out of here. Right? <laughs> um, as opposed to, you know, less, you know, stressful conditions where they'll, they'll make fewer uh, left, right alternations. And, and so that's kind of, we've been using it as kind of a mechanism to ask animals you know, how much do you want to walk in a straight line is kind of the question we're asking. But the uh, the the context is usually when there's a predator around or what we're doing right now in the lab is we're looking at this hydration question. So if the maze is dry versus if the maze is humid. Oh, you know, yeah. What, is that, what does that do? Yeah. Is it lots of straight straight lines you're trying to get out? So uh, this is like hot off the press of stuff. We literally started this experiment a few days ago and we started with the dry condition and oh my God, it's left, left, right. You know, there's these mazes we make. There's one outcome of that maze where you make all opposite directions wow. and man, they are just making a beeline for the one that has all these opposite directions. So I'll be really interested when the students probably next week replicate the experiment using, uh, you know, humid conditions to see if that changes the behavior. That's very cool. Yeah, it's really, really uh, neat. And and really, you know, it, it, I know we're running out of time, but uh, but but you know, I started off by saying, you know, what what do I? Why am I interested in isopods? And it's it's not them per se necessarily. I'm so interested in decisions, and so the fun of the kind of research that that we do in my lab that Kelly's been a part of in the past is uh, is finding clever ways to get animals to make sophisticated decisions. So even something like an isopod that arguably is probably just, it's probably not doing cognition and it's probably just reacting to, you know, things that the nervous system is pre-coded to, to do the right thing under most of the time. But, 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 you know, you don't get the answer to these questions by doing neuroanatomy. You know, you get the answers to these questions by asking the animals to do a thing and then seeing what they do. So, so we can usually come up with some really sophisticated choices to, to, to force them into and, and then their decisions then tell us a lot about their biology. That's awesome. That's, yeah, it's fun. It makes me, well, I'm going to come visit when your students are, so Sounds I can good. check out their maze. Sounds good. The lab's a mess, by the way. It's not my fault. <laughs> oh, it was a mess when I was there. Oh, it's messy. <laughs> it's messy. I, I, I became a dean about seven years ago, and so I'm not in the lab very much anymore. And uh, and it shows. <laughs> it's oh, like no. seven years of students without me cleaning up after them. <laughs> and I think uh, I think Derek had one question. I'm looking at our when I'm looking to the side here. I have another laptop open with a Discord, so I could read. Um, Derek says they. He heard they may interact with heavy metals and soil. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that is true. That that's a there's a huge literature on that. There's a lot of papers published on that, and and because it's not closely aligned to my own research interests, I haven't read that stuff very deeply. But I know because when I search for papers about their behavior, I see you know many many papers about um, heavy metal uh, exposure, and and so there there's a lot of interest in them. Uh, from the scientific, from the toxicology community, because, you know, you'll go to a place where there's been like, um, you know, a heavy metal contamination of the soil. And so, you know, plants don't want to grow there much and people sure as heck can't be there much, you know, cause it's just very toxic and poisonous. And then you find a thriving population of these terrestrial isopods. And so you're like, what's that about? Right. And so they're apparently able to sequester the heavy metals in some way, um, huh. that, that, you know, produces the toxicity and they've evolved, you know, various levels of resistance to the toxins and things like that. So I think there's kind of a, an applied science kind of interest there. Like what's, you know, what let's look at their tissues. Let's look at the way they're processing these, these heavy metals, uh, you know, to give us maybe some clues 
on how to maybe clean up the environment where we live or come up with treatments for people that are that are exposed to heavy metals or you know or or give us uh, insight on how to remediate uh polluted environments so that you know the soil becomes functional again and, and other organisms i mean this hits close to home um we have a colleague in the department where, where i'm at at montclair state who studies um contaminated soils at liberty state park which yeah. Yeah, which used to be like I can a, see from my window. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's like it's like a forest. It's like a forest, right? But yeah. it shouldn't be because it's full of heavy metals and nasty, all sorts of nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. Because it was a rail yard in the past, and all these chemicals and and nasty things were shipped in and out of there, and spills and you name it. There's uh, a lot of chromium and um, yeah, 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 bad lots stuff. Of chromium here. here yeah. yeah, but but yet a forest grows there, and isopods are there. I'm quite sure. Um, and so the professor in, in our department, who's, there's a couple of professors actually who study this, they're looking at kind of the, the soil microbes, the mm -hmm. fungi and the other kinds of soil microbes and sort of how they're interacting with the plants and how the plants are. You guys were talking about gut fauna earlier. It's kind mm -hmm. of a similar thing. You know, the microbes are kind of, you know, driving what's happening above the soil. And, um, and so there's a few strips in there where nothing will grow. I mean, nothing will grow. And but next to it is a forest, you know. And so they're really interested in sort of the the microbial community, you know, in both kinds of soil and what's going on different and everything like that. So so yeah, there's a lot of interest in that for for applied reasons. And isopods can be part of that story because there are populations that are living in places where animals should not be able to live. That's wild. Yeah. That's really wild. That's their other superhero power, right? Yeah. <laughs> they can really, yeah. really scrape out a living. Yeah. You can just zap it with a chromium ray and they're like, bring it. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. I just think about what you said about like the, I don't know when they split. When did they decide to come on land? I assume so long ago. Yeah, a long time so, ago. Yeah. So long ago. Long time ago. But, but they're pretty much the same shape. And to me, that always says, hey, you made it. You found the shape that we like yeah. my friend and i always joke about how everything will eventually become a crab um because <laughs> is that the is that the best shape because because crabs just keep showing up no. I, mean, <laughs> I guess crabs have like evolved several times into that basic crabby basic shape. crab shape um but like sounds like isopads are making a big a big argument for mm -hmm. flat scaly tough yeah yeah it, it, clearly it's working out for them them and horseshoe crabs yeah yeah, like anything that lives on land, especially any animal that lives on land, you know, look at how common jointed appendages are on land, right, relative to mm -hmm. water. Um, so you can, you can, you know, most things in the water are actually worms. So, but, um, but on land, above the soil on land. You know, most <laughs> I was going to say most things on land are worms too. Yeah, most things on land are worms. <laughs> most things are, are in the sediment, right? They're, they're, they're like burrowing through their food. But but if you're but if you're walking around on the surface of this planet, you, you almost have to have jointed appendages. And so you start thinking about animals that are moving around on the surface and the number of those that don't have jointed appendages gets pretty small, pretty quick. Um, so uh, so definitely they've got that going for them uh, and they've capitalized on that uh, to, to do pretty well. It's amazing there. Amanda, you, you've got a little guy. Do you think he'd want some isopod pets? Oh, bro. If. If I thought he could handle not opening up the box to make them crawl on him, I would definitely be getting it. Plus, my husband is, of course, anti-bug, which is truly the, the the greatest tragedy of this podcast is that it has done nothing to change my husband's mind about bugs being... Cody is very grossed out by bugs. He doesn't want any part of it. Like, even like ladybugs. He's like, ugh. And I'm like, it's a ladybug. She oh. Um, But yeah, because we... Because Ted wanted... My son, my son wanted a ant farm not that long ago because he saw one at Winco. He thought, "Oh, that'd be so cool!" And I was like, "We cannot because they would get out, and mm -hmm. then you'd have an ant farm as your bedroom, and that that can't be allowed." But <laughs> but a roly poly pet, I thought, I thought you could take care of that. You know, you spray a little spray bottle on it once a day. I think you could probably do it. Yeah. Feed it, feed it vegetable scraps from dinner. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Literally put them in a little box with a wet sponge and a carrot. And this thing will live for three years. They, they, they need almost no care. They're super chill. I kind of yeah. want some. Uh, I kind of want some for my apartment. I don't think I don't think Joe would be into it, but they're just so yeah. cute. And I, I liked working with them in the lab. Uh, Derek, does, does your wife like the buggy, the flesh eating beetles or would she prefer a roly poly farm? 
she doesn't come down here. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't even see them. Der- uh, Derek has a colony of domestids. Oh, domestids are fun. I wasn't sure where that was going to go. I thought they might be the burying beetles. The the uh, there they are. The uh, oh my god, the silver day. What are those? The ones that the the carrion beetles. You know, like where the and oh. they, they've got a whole cool story with biparental care and stuff. And you know, they males and females pair up and raise their kids on a dead thing and regurgitate how romantic yeah it's very romantic (laughs) this could be us but you play and we could be regurgitating yeah (laughs) yeah there we uh we'll never run out of topics to talk about on this podcast because true there are so many fascinating animals out there to talk about and we're pretty loose with what we consider a bug anyway so crunchy on the outside gooey on the inside that's That's all it takes that's all it takes (laughs) and even then we're going to break the rules because eventually you know we're going to talk about a worm that's soft on the outside or a squid even and well shrimp i think you wanted to talk about a shrimp at some point we'll have to get a shrimp expert because i don't know a ton about shrimp yeah shrimps is shrimps is bugs or shrimps the cousins of our isopod friends yeah, they're cousins, I would say. Yeah, I think they yeah have they're crustaceans. Shape. Yeah. How are you drawing, Amanda? I am. I'm very quickly. This is not going to be a quality sketch, so I apologize. But I am quickly sketching out our isopod friend here. Mm-hmm. This is the part Derek always has to cut out so that it seems like <laughs> cut out the drawing fast. part. <laughs> seems like I was faster than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Whether uh, was there anything else you wanted to cover, either about isopods or parental, like interesting parental care? Um, I, I would just care. say that yeah, while while Amanda is sketching out our superhero, uh, I will touch on the, kind of the diversity of the way parental behavior plays out in the animal kingdom. So, mm-hmm. um, so it, as I mentioned earlier, including all animals, including us, um, parental care is relatively rare, um, but among the vertebrates, it's relatively common, right? Especially in the mammals where, where it's kind of obligated on the female uh, because of the way we, we reproduce. So, so when parental care happens, it is usually only the female that, that provides it uh, in the rare cases when it happens at all. More rare is when the male stays with that female and the two do it together like birds, mm-hmm. songbirds at least. But even more rare still is when only the male does it. So the female leaves the eggs with the male and then he takes care of them. So, uh, you know, so we talked about marsupiums today. Well, you know, seahorses and pipefish do that. Uh, and it's the male that does that. And my very first foray into research was with uh, an insect that does that, where the female glues her eggs on the male's body and uh, he cares for them until they hatch. So, um, so sort of like circling back to the beginning of our conversation, the thing that I'm most interested in, uh, in when, when I look at behavior is, you know, decisions about doing things. And so that is what picked my curiosity at my, the very beginning of my journey as a scientist was why would a male take on the, the full care of offspring and relieve the female of it entirely like what's going on evolutionarily, ecologically, you know, nerve, nervous system. Yeah, that's a really odd choice. It's super odd. And it, and it, and it, and it, and it, and it, and the male gives up the whole thing Darwin wrote about in, in the sexual selection stuff, because he gives up the opportunity to mate with other females. So mm-hmm. he's stuck holding the bag, so to speak, and he cannot mate again until those kids are off his body. And so, uh, so he's doing the opposite of what Darwin would have predicted under sexual selection. So, so, um, so yeah, those are the kind of things that kind of get my, my attention in, in, in the living world. Like there's a rare, weird thing that doesn't make sense. Oh, I want to study that. Right. So when, uh, generally when parental care falls to the male, does the brood size tend to be larger or smaller than when it's female? It kind of depends on, yeah, exactly. It depends on the species. So in something like a stickleback fish, which, uh, have you ever met, did you, you know this, right, Kelly, that you're like academically descended from, from Nico Tenbergen, right? So, so Tenbergen <laughs> is the founder of ethology, right? Of the, of the, of yeah, the biological of it. behavior. And so you're, you've got a good pedigree because, because it comes right down to you through me from Tenbergen three generations back. And, uh, and Tenbergen studied these stickleback fish, and he was very interested in their mating behavior. The, the males do take care of the young by themselves. The females lay eggs in a little nest he builds, uh, and then the female goes off and makes more eggs. And 
So for that species, it actually makes sense because the male may have eggs in his nest already, but he's still like courting females. He's like, hey, baby, come on, check out my nest, right? And there's some evidence, there's some evidence that females might actually prefer to mate with a male that has eggs in his nest because somebody else already did the checking. He's sexy. Uh, two, he's got a vested interest in staying there and taking care of things. So I'll throw my eggs in there too, right? Why, not that they think about this, but you can see where the, the argument goes. So, so in that case, the male is not giving up the male prerogative. He can just keep mating, right? But with a water bug, they can't. They can only carry as many eggs that can be stuck on their body. So there is a finite number of eggs they can have. And mm -hmm. when the number is reached, they're, they're, they can't take anymore. So they truly give up um, promiscuous behavior. They give up the, the ability to, to mate with multiple females until They've they've hatched the young and they don't live very long. They're a seasonal animal, so you know at, at best you're you're maybe going to get a couple of clutches if you're lucky. Um, and they do have a 50, 50 50 sex ratio. So then there's some interesting stuff there. But but where I was going with that was that the when you do see uniparental male care, things like seahorses and water bugs really pay a cost. They can only carry so many. Yeah. So what is the benefit then for? The benefit seems to be things like um, um, high confidence of uh, paternity. So when you look at, when you do like genetic, even back before we could like, believe it or not, I'm old enough that that uh, I predate DNA fingerprinting. <laughs> and so, so when I started my work, uh, you didn't know who the daddy was. Uh, at least you couldn't do like DNA work to determine who the daddy was. And uh, so you had to do like Mendelian level stuff where you had to have like phenotypic traits that were true breeding, you know, oh, that, God. <laughs> you know, that you knew the genetics of, right, exactly. And so using that, uh, some another scientist in these water bugs actually identified some of those kind of genetic markers and was able to do a paternity analysis and found that like 99% of the eggs stuck on the body of the male are sired by that male, right? By him. Mm -hmm. So there's some evidence that the male, um, they have a weird mating system too, where it takes like 24 hours to mate. Uh, the male inseminates her and then she lays one egg and then he inseminates her again and she oh, lays one geez. egg. So you, a long you, like, yeah, like a hundred eggs, that takes a while. But you know how it works in insects is with their little spermatheca. If you're the one that just mated with her, it's your sperm that are likely to be on the eggs. Yeah. You know? So, so, uh, so the male sort of like, gets insurance that the uh, the offspring are his. So there seems to be a very tight correlation between paternity assurance. And, uh, and so, so, you know, males, males do pretty well, even though they're not mating promiscuously. And if you think about it, females of all species, <laughs> all species have 100% maternal <laughs> assurance. Uh, the eggs, the eggs are always hers. Always, yeah. Um, so biologically, genetically, a water bug is kind of, a male water bug is kind of like a female water bug, right? They both have very high uh, levels of, of assurance. They're the parents of the things they're taking care of. There was recently a Reddit thread that, that blew up big. There was a guy who was convinced that his girlfriend was pregnant with the girlfriend's roommate's baby. Because when women sync up their periods, they can change eggs. Yeah. It's like, dude, this is the this is the one thing that humans have in life is that you know that you're the mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not your, what are you doing, man? Yeah. <laughs> please, oh, yeah. Go back to, please go back to school, please. The I'm education like, system failed that guy. Yeah. That is, that's pretty gnarly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bad. Oh, Amanda. So Amanda shared the art in our Discord. Can okay. we get that in Scott's? Yeah, did, I gave it to the Discord so that Derek could make the Imgur link. That yeah, just a to. moment. Okay. So I've given them, um, I've given one, I made, I made a team up pair, a team up oh, pair, no. because we had the, the rollers and the runners. <laughs> but they do, are they are both wearing roller skates, because that was funnier to me. <laughs> but of course, if we were talking about roller derby, they have to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So one has like shield powers and a baby. And one is clearly very fast with less shield powers, but still some shields armor, I'd say, on on her her still skate form. Derek will give you a link here in just a second. Cool. I, I anytime I can add a baby in a harness to one of these heroes, I always <laughs> always do. <laughs> Should know that that's like my secret weakness is anytime I can add a baby to one of the drawings. Amanda's momness coming. My through. momness is get in there. 
I just think it's really interesting when a when a bug has a mom. Yeah. Because like we were saying, they just it's just not common. It's just yeah. you leave the eggs and you leave. A moth isn't your mom. A moth sires you and then takes off. Goodbye. I never met my father. I never met my father. I met my like father. that one guy. <laughs> Finding Nemo the shark. So I'm looking forward to seeing this. this. This makes me think before I've seen this image, I'm thinking of the Norman Reedus, Reedus video game character in Death Stranding that's got the little oh, yeah, yeah. baby in the thing <laughs> strapped onto him or something. <laughs> Don't fall down. <laughs> Did you play that game at all? Scott? I played it and I'll be honest with you. I know it was like game of the year or whatever, but, but after about I don't know. Twelve hours of that game, I was kind of like, it's a little repetitive, and I and I got sick of it. Yeah. So I never finished. Really? That game. I feel like it's, it's there's some things that managed to get through the award season just by being visually spectacular, mm. and there's no doubt that it was visually it was. stunning. It was very beautiful. But game wise, I don't know that it was just taking you know. a long walk. Now, now, <laughs> well, unless you think I don't have the uh, the 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 stamina to stick with the game, I just finished Baldur's Gate three after 195 hours. Ooh. So, uh, so I, I don't know I, that anyone has ever finished it. I don't. Oh, I didn't think it was finishable. <laughs> oh, it's it's that that game is beautiful. I I love that yeah. game. That was I literally yeah. cried at the end when uh, when one of the characters died at the end. I was like, ah. <laughs> oh, I'm only like a little bit of the ways in mm-hmm. because I've been uh, doing a lot of writing for my. Oh, you're doing research, yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. I don't, you know, it's close to the end. You tell how much. You have time to take in. a two hundred hour D and D session <laughs> on the side. Well, what's nice about having a podcast guest is I don't have to be the expert for that week, oh, so I don't have to do the work. Very nice. You know, um, I can just focus on my writing, which Scott, you'll eventually get. I promise. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> this we actually made a trade, Kelly and I, um, and so Kelly, in return, is going to. I'm negotiating a a way for us to send some experts into the public schools where our university mm. is to talk about cool stuff to cool kinds of animals or whatever. And Kelly is going to be one of our entomologists that goes in and inspires the next generation of scientists that want to study cool things like this. And I know you'll, you, you know, based yeah. on just this kind of stuff, I know you're going to go in there and knock their socks off and somebody will become an entomologist who wouldn't have because you're going Aww. to do that. Yeah. Well, Scott, you're the best. You could be the marine biologist to someone's Lisa Frank. Right. <laughs> I don't know if I can make bugs that cool. I think you can. Yeah, I think you can. I can try. Yeah, um, I I believe in you. It's surprising me that more uh, bug based heroes aren't already on entomologists. Like Peter Parker is not an entomologist. Good point. There, there should be, and there's, there's a lot of spider people now. At least one of them should be an entomologist. Yeah. Yeah, I de- definitely, Kelly. Tell not, not telling you what kind of content you're the expert, but but I think that if you tie this cool superhero stuff to what you talk about, you know, there's going to be like Marvel nerds in the room. They're like, "Oh my yeah. god, I could do that! <laughs> I could do that for a living." I I could, yeah, I could definitely. Um, this, I mean, bugs do have superpowers. Yeah, they just they just do. They do. So, yeah, That's the cool. point of the podcast is for every bug to have their own Spider-Man. That's awesome. Oh, okay, well, it looks like Derek emailed you the. Okay, let's I see. thought he was going to put it in the, the chat. I, it looks like he was having trouble with it. Like it... <clears throat> I had a, I have a very friendly cat this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see Desi is all over you. She was all up in your grill. <laughs> <laughs> father, father, pay attention to me, father. Actually, that's that's way too extroverted for Desi. She'd be like, father, father, please, father, I need your pets, father. Usually it's Rapunzel. That's okay. Who is a little uh, Rapunzel just sits in the chair, but today it's Desi. My cats aren't allowed in here while I'm recording because they will be a, a danger. Um, yeah. Amanda, how many? I guess out of ten legs, would you give? Normally it's not a six legs. Yeah, we even we even talk about why do they have so many gosh darn legs? Yeah, I think that's a crustacean thing. I don't know. I think they they, they inherit that from their own ancestors. They've got a. <laughs> Buku under there and, and this is going to sound stupid because i should definitely know this basic biology fact about these organisms but i, I don't off the top of my head remember how many it's like 10 pairs maybe it's, something i think like it's that. 10 yeah 10 yeah. overall so five pairs something like that yeah. i google it now it looks little... like there's a little bit of a variety and, and there that, there well could be that's right yeah so yeah that that turns out to be an easy thing to developmentally modify in an embryo of a of a of an arthropod just you know, change the number of segments in there and you get more legs or less legs. Yeah, because this guy definitely has 16 legs, but this guy only has 10. 
Yeah, it's like, like a really <laughs> big ones have fourteen legs, so it might depend on. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Bugs need more heroes. Let's see. Oh, wait, it's loading. Oh, there's the baby. <laughs> wait, let me get this. There we go. Oh, that's cool. Very nice. I love the armor plates that she's slinging around herself. That's neat. I love very, it. Very cool, Amanda. And Amanda will get that cool. colored in and, you know, the, the rough sketches. It's hard for, I give Amanda a lot of credit for having to quickly draw on no the fly. Kidding. While that having a superb. I love it. That is so neat. Wow. So I like cool. the kinetics that are inherent in the, the art, you know, like, like these guys are moving. <laughs> Stuff is in motion. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, action lines always make you look like you're really booking. That's that's what <laughs> that's what a year of, of college uh, comic studies taught Very me. Very nice. Are, are they both ladies, Amanda? It looks like they're both I ladies. I would assume they're both. I kind of went with and androgynous for <laughs> yeah. both. But uh, I would assume that they are ladies. So legs-wise, I mean, I think they're pretty cool. I think the fact that they've maintained the same basic shape for so gosh darn long really <laughs> speaks to how how successful they are yeah. they're really cute they don't bite you you can pick them up you know that i'm biased against bugs i can interact with safely yeah um, <laughs> they're being helpful for research i assume someone's using them in research that is like probably medically yeah i think especially relevant. the heavy metal stuff that that derek was yeah. asking about earlier that's definitely got to have medical health environmental health yeah practical stuff yeah i think i think they're cool i think they're a 10 out of 10 bug 10 out of 10? 10, 10, 10 out of 10 legs. Right. Or 14 out of 14, depending <laughs> on what kind of bugs are. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, I think I'd probably give it... Um, I, I'm a little biased because I worked with them. And I yeah. and they, you know, I have such fond memories of being in Scott's lab and, and doing my masters. So I, I guess I'm going to have to give them a 10. Right. And, I, and I want some kind of right now after talking about <laughs> I don't I kind of want to get a rolling fully farm too. I kind of think we could you could get a really big shallow one so my son's not knocking it over. I, and just I think put so. Let's put it on the shelf. Sponges in there. If you got some of those like fish castles, would they like that? Would they like those those castles you put in a fish tank? <laughs> they crawl in there. They would probably be indifferent, but 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 <laughs> give them some place, give them some place that's sheltered. Yeah, they're probably going to head for the yeah. shelter so that they'll pretend like they love it, I would say. Oh, yeah. perfect. You have no, to put no. little crumpled up damp paper towel in the fish castle. Yeah, for they really them. like that. Yeah. 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 They love a damp paper towel. Scott, how many legs would you give out of, we'll say out of 10? Out of 10 for the isopods. And I'm going to compare this to, to all the animals I've ever studied. Um, and so in fairness, because I've studied some very interesting kinds of things, I'd have to give them probably an 8 out of 10. It's still because, pretty high. Because the, the water bug I was telling you about uh, – probably takes the 10 and maybe someday I'll have a return engagement. And that, that animal would make a cool superhero because they have praying mantis front legs. Mm -hmm. They've got piercing sucking mouth parts that they can puncture mm -hmm. their prey and suck liquids out of them. And, and they carry the eggs on their back. That's pretty cool. But we'll you'll maybe to, hit them another time. You'll have to come back for father's day next year. Oh, that would be fun. <laughs> Our yeah. father, we, we did um, harvest men for this father's day. Gotcha. All right. Well, we can do Bella stomatids if you want to have me back on father's day. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, I had one more question from my yes. husband is, can you eat them? Um, that, like I that. don't see why not, but I think they're probably mostly going to be uh, exoskeleton, which probably isn't something you want to be eating. But, but I would imagine that the bigger ones, the aquatic ones probably have some meat in there. They're probably getting crabs. There's Emperor's New Groove. They eat like a roly poly. I don't know if you've seen Emperor's New Groove. Yeah, like a long that. time ago. Yeah. <laughs> David Speed, right? But they like whack one open and it's like all steamed. On yeah. The I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Now. Yeah. It's probably yeah, like a lobster. Versions that are bigger. It, yeah. It's yeah. it's more like a lobster. Yeah. And lobsters are edible. So I don't, yeah. if you've got a big enough one, you could probably eat it. Yeah. Probably like we say everything tastes like chicken. It probably tastes like lobster if you eat yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Crab legs. Uh, Scott, do you have any um, social media or websites you want us to link to? I, Maybe anything for CSAM or, or just oh, you. um, we can do that. Other than other than the the College of Science and Math webpage, I don't have any any fun social media. Um, at one time, and this is like ten years ago, so it's it's dead. It's probably still out there somewhere. But I had a birds and bees blog that I was running, where every night or every week I would publish some 
wacky animal something something oh something. cool but uh but it, as you guys know from doing this it was so labor intensive to do it that uh, it was in, it was interfering with my ability to do the rest of my life so i, I eventually <laughs> lost my stamina and didn't keep it up but i was having fun with it i was just starting to build a little bit of an audience and then i was like oh i can't do this anymore but uh so that so please don't link that because it's old and it's <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah, yeah. Well, if you want us to link anything, just email me. Okay, we'll do. And we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. And okay. So to answer your question, Kelly, you can buy a roly-poly farm pocket habitat with 10 Dalmatian roly-polies for $40 on Amazon. Oh, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. <laughs> Next week, I'm going to see you setting up your little farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, um. Thanks, Scott. We yeah. really appreciate you coming. You were an awesome guest. Thank you. I was, this was fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. Bugs Need Heroes was created by Derek Conrad and Kelly Zimmerman. Hosted by Amanda Allen Nide and Kelly Zimmerman. Bugs Need Heroes is produced and edited by Derek Conrad, with some assistance from Chelsea Bodden and a few cats. Character art is by Amanda Allen Nide. Our music is Ladybug Castle by Roll Music. Got a bug question? Email us at bugsneedheroes at gmail.com. Check us out at bugsneedheroes.com, and most of the socials are under Bugs Need Heroes. Thank you to the Entomological Society of America for the Chrysalis Fund grant. Yeah, it's all way more complex than we, we tend to think about. Yeah. I just like to talk about sex all the time. So you know, yeah. paper, that's great. I'm not even kidding. Parental advisory. <laughs> yeah, no, but exactly. No, you know, there's like a thing called ratemyprofessor.com. And, and yes, yeah. I've seen mine. And somebody one time said something like, when he starts talking about sex, just smile. You know? <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> Just, did, you, did you get that makes you sound like a creeper it sounds like, yeah, exactly but it's all this, this stuff it's not creepy stuff <laughs> sex is a very important part of biology it, it drives you a know, lot of biology it drives yep it drives humans it drives oh, everything yeah. so absolutely <laughs>